As far as my background goes, I'm a family nurse practitioner and Ms. Powers is a family nurse practitioner. So we bring that to, to you all. And I work one day a week in the Jonesboro Elementary School as my practice site. So we can treat anyone from before they're born all the way up till the day they die. Uh, we have a whole, a whole uh, spectrum of who we see and treat. But we love, love, love health assessment. You guys have worked hard to get here and um, you're here, you're here. And so this is the course where I know you're taking patho, I know you're taking communication, and I'm ta you're taking intro online, but this is the course where you're gonna get your hands-on experiences and start handling equipment, whether it be stethoscopes or otoscopes. Um, I just put this one together. You know, in the hospital, how many of you have been in the hospital before, like CNAs, PCPs, that kind of thing? Okay, some of you. So you've seen this, the, um, the otoscopes off the wall, right? Well, they just, you just pull them off and it flips a switch, but this one is the old fashioned kind that you could carry anywhere and you actually have to put it together. And when you come to my clinic in Jonesboro, we don't, we have this kind. So it's always, an, I want to make sure all of you do this before the end, but you actually t put it on together and then you turn the light on like that. Uh, so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna, um, I worked until 12.40 midnight last night on the lab packet, which we really call it the course packet. It has the guidelines for all your assignments in it. You didn't get that in advance, but you did get um, the syllabus and the schedule. Again, we've been working really hard to, to really make this course um, a fun course um, where you're gonna get the skills you need so that you can go to the bedside next semester as foundation students and be ready to do a head to toe physical. That is our goal for you. And so I thought it would be fun for me to first of all ask you all if you had any questions about the syllabus. That's one thing I wanna do because we only have an hour and a half together. And I wanted to ask you also if, if anything you've seen so far that you have questions about. And then what I would like to do is demonstrate a head to toe. I wanna demonstrate the actual performance exam without the taking off of, you know, um, Ms. Powers said she'd be my, my, uh, my patient. But I wanna show you how concise it is and also how easy it's gonna be for you. And I wanted to give you that as your as your end point where you're gonna do great in theory. I have no doubt you're gonna do great in theory. And then be able to do that performance exam, which only takes about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes from head to toe. So I thought I would demonstrate that for you just to give you an idea. And then every lab, as you do skills, we're gonna continue putting those pieces together. So every lab, you can take what you learned attach it to the head to toe guidelines and see, by the end when you have to do that performance exam in front of a faculty you are going to be so ready you are going to be so ready so that's another thing we're going to do and then um, finally i'm going to present some material on vital signs to you today um, and some of you know how to take vital signs if you're cnas or pcps some of you do not, and that's okay, because we're going to practice vital signs on Tuesdays and Thursdays lab next week, and then the following week, you'll be checked off on those skills. But next week is a vital signs lab you're gonna be practicing. So, if you'll notice in your syllabus, if you had a chance to read it, because I just uploaded it, I think yesterday morning, or maybe the day before, and I got your schedule last night, the, um, Requirement for both class and lab are your, your, your uniforms. Good evening, my name is Teresa Wexler. Um, I had a secret I was going to tell you, but since we're getting videotaped, now I'm going to tell you anyway, I have the best job here. I really do. How many ever used simulation or seen the simulation labs? We have simulations in our labs and simulators that can do things in health assessments such as, hopefully your lab partner's normal, right? Good heart, good lungs, good everything. We can give you abnormal in there. We all wish that we had this when we were in school because before it's just your live lab partner and most of them ain't gonna have a heart murmur or pneumonia or anything like that. So we have that capability now to let you hear the abnormals. We also, as you progress in the program, we have a mannequin that births babies. We have mannequins that we use for med surge. Uh, the mannequins in there are human patient simulators and 
Some of them have the capability of just hearing sounds. Some of them actually breathe and their chest moves and they look at you and they, their eyes blink. We can make them vomit and bleed and all this other stuff. So what we do for health assessment is we start you off with that. The day that you have your lab, you will come over if you're doing lungs for the day, we give you abnormal and normal lung sounds. If you're doing cardiac for the day, we give you cardiac things. But you do test at the end in the CCE with simulation, and there's three primary areas you're looking at, and it's lung sounds, heart sounds, and a count, and it's on your rub uh, rubric that's in there, and abdominal sounds. We go through a practice with you. There's a mandatory practice that you'll attend, and we also have plenty offerings that you can come to other practices as well, but you are required that one practice. We're very tight schedule in there. Just in the fall of last year, we had 917 simulation events that came through there. So it's just one after the other, which we enjoy, but we have to stay on time. So that's why when you have a simulation CCE or the open practice, if we say it starts at two o'clock, at two o'clock the doors shut, the thing is slid to that we're in use and we start our sessions. Because what it is when you do the open practice, there's four of you in that at a time. The first 15 minutes we go over what we're looking at and stuff. The next 15 minutes, two lab partners go over it. The next two, uh, 15 minutes, two more. And then the last 15, we act like we're testing. So we have to really stay on time. Uh, you have to be in your uniform with your name badge and your stethoscope and your watch. And it's all written in the syllabus, the, the lab packet is what it's called in it. Uh, I have to take my hat off my nice hat for a minute and be my firm hat goes on for just a minute because those mannequins range from a couple of hundred dollars to two hundred thousand dollars a piece. So that's why you see this little sign on the door that says no food, drink or water or ink pens. The water, if it got into the simulator and we've had some stuff occur like that, if it goes into the simulator, it's an electronic computer and it can ruin it. Okay. And you're, out, you're also signing a thing that says you're accountable and held responsible for any uh, type of things in the lab and stuff like that. So you could actually be held responsible for it. So that's my firm hat on. The ink pens, if you touch an ink pen into it, it bleeds like a tattoo. So if you don't want to be a nurse and you want to be a billionaire, if you can invent the type of product that will take the ink out of the simulators, because simulators are used a lot, then you don't have to even go to nursing school. You could be that you were in Bahamas retiring because you invented that. Uh, you met Miss Gregg as well and she coordinates the skills lab, same rules there with the food, drink, and water. You and we, can You can have ink pens. Okay. And what we do if you have the ink pen out, we just as a courtesy give you a pencil. Okay. If you take the ink pen out again twice, we take it away from you till the end of class. Okay. So we have a lot of ink pens in there if you ever need any extra for other classes. Uh, but we go over exactly how the test is. You're well practiced for it when you go in there. We just have a few of those rules on there. Any burning questions about the simulation labs? Thank you, and I look forward to it. We have fun when we're in there. We're in Las Vegas when they're, when they're in there. We've got the rule of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But what happens at, when you're getting tested goes on your report card or your grade book. Okay? So we want to have fun when we're learning in there. Okay? But we're also following the rules and following the guidelines for nursing and stuff. There are cameras in there. I forgot to say that part. You have a confidentiality form that you'll be signing. And the cameras, we have cameras in the skills labs. We have cameras now in the uh, sim labs. They just now got the camera part of the visual. We've got to work on the audio part of it next. And what we use those for, they're all for learning. Maybe you were testing and doing your CCE exam. We can actually record it. And maybe you say, well, Miss Merriman, I swear I did an apical heart rate. And because we're looking and grading. And she might say, well, you know, I didn't see you do it. That's one thing that we could look back on and see. But we also use them when you get in those progressive scenarios to see how well you do in patient care. And we play it back to you. And we show you first, we ask you, what went well in your scenario today? And then we ask you, what would you have done differently? Because if you make a mistake, you probably already know it. We don't have to beat you up over and stuff. But that's to play it back to let you see how you did. So that's why you're signing a confidentiality. These are not put out on YouTube or all these other places they could go. They're just used for the College of Nursing for your education. All right. Thank you all very much. What I'd like to do now is 
I, and again, continue, if, write some questions down over the weekend. Um, if you have some more questions about this, or once you get a chance to look at your course packet, which does have, um, I put a table of contents in there. And so, for instance, when um, one of us are, were lecturing about nutritional assessment or health history, then your assignment, will pull out the assignment in your course packet. So be sure you bring your book and lab manual to both theory and to your lab, because you're going to use it in both. What I love about Jarvis, which is your book, is it has awesome pictures in it. So if you're actually doing the exam, it can show you where to put your stethoscope. Do you like the pictures in it? I love it. I want to tell you another tip, and this is a first test taking tip. It has the normals usually on the left side, and then it's going to have a pink column that lists the abnormals of systems. And faculty love to write test questions about the abnormals. We want you to nail the normals, but if you say that the skin is supposed to be warm and dry, then over in that right-hand column, there's going to be a something about someone that's too hot or, too, or super moist. So look for those abnormals when you're studying. That's a study tip. Look at the column that talks about those abnormals. All right, what I want to do just for fun, and I want you to grade me, okay? So I want you to turn your course packet, and where's my course packet? I want you to turn in your course packet to, um, let's see, it says um, page 27 of your course packet. Let me see if that's where I'm going. Because I just want to show you, it's about five after two. I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of nervous. I've been teaching a long time, but I'm so excited about being here that I'm, I'm acting almost like I've had a glass of wine, <laughs> but I haven't. Uh, <laughs> I could use one, but I haven't. Okay, sometime. I don't think that mixes with NyQuil, so I've been holding off. All right. Well, all right, I'm not really crazy about this. Well, page 27 is actually the performance grade sheet for the head to toe. So when you get to that point, which you all will get to that point, this is the grade sheet that your faculty will have when you do this head to toe performance exam. So the other thing about this also is each of you will choose a partner in your lab that you feel comfortable working with. We do not want you to feel uncomfortable and if you want to choose a, a girl if you're a girl and a guy if you're a guy or if it doesn't matter, I've had mixed groups. But you, you, you choose a lab partner, and if you don't know a lab partner, then we'll see you know, how your lab faculty can help you with that. But when it comes time, the, this, you're going to have a couple of things um, beside you. And I'm going to back you up a little bit. All right. So the exact guidelines for this head to toe are on page 21. It tells you what you do. But here's what you actually will do, page 22 page 23 and page 24 are the actual written guidelines. So on the left side is what you say or what you do, and then on the right side will be exactly what you document. Okay, so we've spelled it out for you. Now on page 25, so hang on to that because you're going to watch me do it, and I'm going to try to do these three pages without notes. Page 25 is a blank sheet. This sheet that's blank will be right beside your bed when you do this head to toe. It doesn't have notes on it. You're going to have to memorize what goes in it. But as you're doing your head to toe, if you want to write down some comments about what you see on your partner, that's fine. However, by the time you get to this point, you are going to know your partner head to toe. And you're going to know how their heart sounds and you're going to know what their skin, you're going to know about that mole on their right arm. And you'll probably already know that it's two centimeters. That's kind of big. But at any rate, you'll have this beside you. It cannot be filled out. That wouldn't be fair. And then this page 26 is the documentation grade sheet. These are, this, if you follow this documentation grade sheet, this is everything that you have to document for 5% of your final grade, head to toe. And you know what? By the time we get there, you're going to document every week in lab, except for these first couple when you're checking off vital signs. But you're going to know this. You're going to nail it, and it's really easy. But you have to hit every one of these points for the grade that's beside it. And you get points. It's worth 100 points. Now, CCE checkoff is this one. And so it's up to you if you want to follow the three page one, or if you want to watch me do it according to like you're the faculty and you're watching me 
you can do it page 27 because this is what we'll use. If you'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, there's some starred items on this and there's some starred items on the simulation checkoff at the end that Ms. Wexler was talking about. Those items are, you have to nail those items to pass this thing. I'm not going to scare you with that. I'm just going to tell you, you can't do a head to toe and forget the heart, right? The heart, the lungs, and the belly are the core of a person. So you've got to nail those things. Everything else is fluff or periphery. We still want you to do it, but it won't kill someone if you don't. But you've got to listen to the heart. You've got to listen to the lungs. Because honestly, airway, breathing, circulation, this is your second test taking tip. I was the testing director here for 15 years is that when you look at a test question or a patient, you have to say, is their airway open and are they breathing? Because if not, they're dead. So it doesn't matter about anything else, right? And then you look at circulation and that's the heart or bleeding. And then safety and pain. So that's the order of test priorities. If you're thinking about how do I prioritize test questions, airway, breathing, circulation, and then is my patient safe or are they in pain? So that's the second tip. The, so the first tip is look at those columns for abnormal. The second one is apply the ABCs when you're looking at test questions in the College of Nursing. All right, so let me show you how to do this. Are you okay with me doing it with you? Can you sit up here like a patient? Mm -hmm. Do you mind? I'm not too old yet. You're not too old? <laughs> you don't have any grandkids. <laughs> I have grandkids, so. You don't know, right? They don't know. They'll learn, they'll learn. All right, so I'm gonna try to now, the fact of the matter is, I'm kind of rusty. I teach health assessment in the summer, so I haven't demonstrated this since the summer. So all I'm going to do, to be fair, is I'm going to just take the blank sheet. This is like one of those um, game show things where you have to get things. All right, let me just pull out my equipment. I have a stethoscope in here somewhere. Oh, okay, I just brought my own stethoscope. Not that I don't think your earpieces are... Okay, but, and then I have my otoscope, but I forgot to bring a speculum, so I won't actually put it in your ear. Okay, okay so you guys grading? You ready? Have fun. Don't be hard on me. Okay. Be gentle. Be gentle. So, and I'm going to talk to her, but I'm also going to talk to you about kind of what I would include in this. All right, so you notice that we always have two things. For every skill, you've got to... Introduce yourself, but make sure you've washed your hands. Okay, so those are two really important things. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Carolyn Merriman, and I'm going to be your nurse today. Um, I've washed my hands, or I'm going to do it right now in the sink. Okay. In the simulation lab, you actually put gel on your hands before you do your simulation. Okay. So you actually do wash your hands. Who wants to touch you? You know, you don't want to touch people. All right. So. Um, so I'm going to be doing um, a head to toe today, which that means I'm going to be listening to your heart and your lungs and your belly and just checking your skin and things like that. Okay. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. You have any concerns before we start? No, I'm in good health powers. Okay. Um, and can you please tell me, Catherine, where we are today? We are at ETSU on the third floor in the forum room. Okay. And can you tell me what time it is? It is, oh, she's peeking. <laughs> <laughs> it's the afternoon. <laughs> okay. All right. Wonderful. Well, um, so like I said, I'm going to be doing like a head to toe exam. And so I usually just start by looking at someone's skin. Now I'm kind of standing over here so you all can see. But um, what I would do then is, can you just hold your arms out for me? Mm -hmm. Okay. And she's going to have, trip. I'm she's going to have a gown on. So I'm going to raise the gown up and I'm going to look at her skin on the front and then I'm going to turn it over and look in the back and then I'm going to go ahead and touch her skin because the back of my hands is checking for temperature and warmth on the top side as well as the bottom side. I'm also checking for moisture. Now at this point I've got a couple of choices but I'm going to go ahead and, and check her leg, uh, uh, visually check her legs as well. So now I'm going to, her, she's got a gown on, I'm going to pull it up to about halfway and you're going to have shorts on ladies and gentlemen. So I'm looking at your legs, the skin, she doesn't have a clothes on there. I'm looking at the back of the skin for lesions and color and then I'm going to check the warmth and the temperature of her legs and the front and the back. Excellent. Okay, well now that, uh, the other thing I'd like to do is just check your pulses. Okay, so I'm going to check her radial pulse, which is the pulse in her wrist on the thumb side, 
at the same time. So you check the pulses at the same time. Since I'm already here at the hand, I'm going to come down and also check capillary refill. So I'm squeezing on each finger, on one on each side, the capillary refill. All right, um, that's great. Now I'm going to come down. Can I raise your thingy yeah, here? I think I oh, she didn't shave her legs. <laughs> okay, this is always a problem with patients. So, okay, what we're going to do then is I'm just going to check. I, 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 I understand that. I understand that. So I'm not going to show my legs either. Okay, so. <laughs> So I'm checking for edema. So you press, this is called the tibia, and you press on the skin with your thumb for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And then I run my hand, and she's got a little bit of edema right there, a little bit like one plus, nothing here. And she's been on her feet all day, so nurses do that. So one plus on the right, zero on the left, and you'll learn to grade edema. Then what I'm going to do is go down. I've got to check her pulses in her feet. Relax your feet. But at the same time, I'm going to check her pedal pulses, which is right here. It's called the dorsalis pedis. I'm just checking for not the rate. I'm just checking for the strength. And we rate pulses. Two plus is considered normal. Okay. So I've checked her pulses. Pulses are a starred item. So is checking for edema. Um, so now what I'm going to do is just check while I'm up here, strength. Can you squeeze my fingers? Excellent. And now will you push against my um, feet, hands, right hands. Okay, so you've got good strength and that's kind of towards the bottom. All right, we've done the skin, we've done pulses, we've done um, strength. And now what I'd like to do is look in your eyes. Okay, I'm going to go back up to the head. Yes, would you take your glasses off? So the only requirement on the head to toe is that you shine a light into her pupils. You're looking for constriction. So at I'm going to just, I always do it this way, ladies and gentlemen, just because the light doesn't shine in both eyes. As, a, as an NP, I do that. But i got to turn it on first. Uh-oh, it's faded. Okay, I have a light. So I'm going to shine it in this eye. Then I'm going to come down and shine it in this eye. And what am I expecting? Constriction with the light. So that is called the pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. The last part of that test is I'm going to see if her eyes change when I have her look far away versus close. So, Ms. Powers, can you look at the very back of that wall? Now, when I tell you, I want you to look at my finger, okay? Look at my finger. Excellent. When she looks at my finger close up, the pupils constrict, and that's a normal reaction because it takes more light to look further away than constriction. So pupils are equal, round, reactive to light. I would, I would chart Perla. Now what I'm going to do, whoops, is I'm going to put a, um, a speculum over this otoscope. This is called an otoscope, and I'm going to look in her ears. So I'm going to turn the light back on. And what you do, turn this way just a hair, is you pull the ear straight back. You put, with the speculum on, you put it in, and then you point it slightly towards the nose, and I'm just looking to see if I see her eardrum, which is called the tympanic membrane. Okay, so I saw it. It was perfect. I lied. Lie. No, you don't lie. You actually see it. But it, it was, it's pearly gray, and it's got a good light reflex. And then I would do it on the other side, put it in there. Excellent. You don't have any ear infections at all. Doing great. All right, the last thing I'm going to do with my light is, and so think about it, eyes, ears, and then mouth. I want you to open your mouth. Say, ah. Uh. I'm going to look on the top and look on each side. Can you raise your tongue? Excellent. And pull your lower lip down, please. I'm looking for her um, mucous membranes. I'm looking for cancer under the tongue, um, especially people with chewing tobacco do that. All right, perfect. All right, so um, now I've done your head, your eyes, your ears, and your mouth. And now what I'd like to do is to look at your respirations. Since you're sitting up, the first part of assessment is inspection. So I'm inspecting your breathing. Take a deep breath just so I can see. Excellent. So I'm checking to see if there's any deformities in her chest wall. And I don't see any. There's something where you measure is the anterior to posterior chest wall less than the across, which is called the transverse. So I'm looking at that to see if it's going to be the same or be bigger, and that's normal. Now I'm going to take my stethoscope and I'm going to listen to about eight places on your chest. We don't listen over clothes, but this is where with a gown you would keep your person covered, you would take care of these, then you would come up under and recover your patient. So um, it's really important to provide privacy. So I would start up above the clavicle. There is um, tissue. I would go here, 
here's the, here's the strategy. You always go across to compare. So that's two sites. I'm going to come in between the ribs at three and then four. Then I'm going to come down here to five and then six. And then I'm going to at least go underneath the breast on both sides. That would be seven and eight in the front. Then I'm going to go to the back and I'm going to do eight to ten sites in the back. Stand up if you don't mind. So in the back, I'm going to remember that there's still lung tissue up here in the shoulder. So I'm going to, and every time I put my stethoscope, I want you to take a deep breath, but you don't have to, Catherine. But that's what I would tell my patient. So there's, I'm going to start on the left side, and I'll show you why. One, two, you got to get around the scapula, so don't go on the bone. Three, and then four. Come down by five, and then six. Here is seven and eight, down nine and then 10, you could actually do 10, but eight is only required. You have a third lung. You don't have a third lung. You have a, you have, a, <laughs> this is gonna be so much fun. <laughs> you have three lobes in your right lung. So because of this third lung, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, you ask your, pa your patient to raise their right arm and then you listen um, about in mid axillary right here as the last sound. If you start over here and you go back and forth and you go back down all the way across. So it's across, down, across, down. You're gonna go side to side. Why do you think we're going side to side? So we're comparing and seeing if they do have some weird sounds. We wanna see what they are and where they are. Okay, so I am done now with your respiratory. Now what I'd like to do is have you lay down on my pillow here. Okay, and I'm going to raise your head of the bed about 30 degrees. Oh, you are like so Pilates. comfortable. This is like Pilates. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. All right, so what I'm gonna do now to keep my friend comfortable <laughs> is going to say, okay, now I'm going to just be looking at, um, I gotta listen to your heart, okay? So um, I'm gonna just put the gown down to here. What the first thing I'm gonna do is just inspect. So I bend down to look across the chest wall. Why am I bending down to look across the chest wall? Rises and falls would be breathing, but what else might I see around the heart that's related to cardiac? If the person has like a murmur or something like that, they could have something called heaves or lifts where you could actually see pulsations. So first I'm gonna inspect because inspection is the first part of health assessment. Now what I need to do is I'm just going to listen to your heart, okay? And so you're gonna have the person laying down at this point um, to do her heart, but okay, Catherine, I'm gonna have you sit up. I'm sorry. You don't do that. You don't make your patient go up and down a lot. But just so she can, I can show you where the stethoscope goes, there's five spots you're going to put your stethoscope for the heart exam. So I'm going to put it at the second intercostal space on the right sternal border, and that's called the aortic valve. I'm going to go directly, and that's the only one you do on the right side. I'm going to go over to the left sternal border at second intercostal space. That's called the pulmonic spot. Then the next one down is called herbs. And then you go down, that's about three. You can go four or five along the sternal border, and that's called the tricuspid. And then fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. And for a woman, you can have them help you take their, you know, move their breast up, but it's really below the bra line, and that's called the mitral, and that's called the apical pulse site. So I'm going to listen for a full minute and get an apical pulse. Okay, Ms. Powers, I've listened to your heart rate, but now I've got to go back and listen with my bell because I'm listening for murmurs now. So, got a choice. I'm gonna listen at five. This is the mitral. Gonna go to the tricuspid, go to herbs. I'm gonna go to pulmonic, and then I'm gonna go to aortic. Okay, we're done with the heart exam, okay? Now what I'd like to do is look at your abdomen. So, I'm so sorry that you have to lay down again. You can keep them in a laying position, but I just wanted to kind of show you. All right, so with the abdomen, I'm gonna look across the abdomen because that's inspection. Now, what would I be looking for in the abdomen? What might you see in the abdomen? Anybody? You could see a hernia. Who said that? Awesome. There's hernias around the, um, the umbilicus, which is the belly button. There's also hernias down in the femoral or the uh, area. Inguinal hernias, the guys can get that sometimes. Um, you could also see what? You can see at the contour. So flat, Miss Powers is flat. 
Some people are rounded. Some people have something called ascites, which is a, maybe their liver's failing and they've got fluid in their belly. And so it's getting really big and that's, you know, third spacing. Okay, but I'm looking, it's flat. With every, every other, every other system you can touch before you listen, except the abdomen. With the abdomen, after you've inspected, you have to listen. So that's a, that's a key thing. So at this point, I've looked, and now I'm going to listen for bowel sounds. The best place to start listening for bowel sounds is the right lower quadrant because the small intestine and the large intestine are, uh, testament, testament are coming together there. So you're going to have wild bowel sounds. So listen here first if you ever want to. Then go in a clockwise motion. So I'm going from the, the right lower. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to go over and then I'm going to come down and you want to listen for the bowel sounds which sound like little tinkling sounds. After I've listened then I'm going to say to my client now I just need to um, lightly touch your belly. Okay. Ask them if they've gone to the, bla the bladder, gone to the bathroom to empty their bladder and you probably should have done that before you have them laying down. So then I'm going to take one hand do you have any pain anywhere, by the way? Mm -mm. Not where I just touched before I asked. Okay. Okay. So we're going to touch lightly with one hand all the way around the belly. And then you take two hands and you go a little bit deeper all the way around the belly. And that's called light and deep palpation. Okay. So that's done now. So really sitting up, you do all the way through respiratory, laying down, you can do heart, keeping this person covered. You only have to expose like the gown up to here. And then the gown, and then down to here to look at the belly. Okay, you can sit back up, madam. All right, so let me see where I'm at. Um, I would also take her blood pressure because I didn't do that yet. Um, I think I need you to stand up so I can look at your back, please. Okay, so I'm going to have you, you are so flexible, you are a young thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just look at her back, make sure it's straight, that there's no kyphosis, which is the rounded part, or scoliosis, which is the S-curve. And then I'm going to palpate the spine. Are there any areas of tenderness here? Okay, and then can you just um, touch your toes slowly? Okay, and I'm just looking down at the, to look for any humps and come back up slowly. Awesome, so I don't see any scoliosis. You okay? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. How did I do? Did, how, did I get okay? Did I miss anything? Let's take a moment now. Um, and if you all don't mind, before we just start talking about vital signs, because we only have about a half an hour, and we're going to give you the overview of vital signs, and then Miss Powers is going to talk to you more about vital signs along with some other content a week from Monday. But I wanted to get you enough so that you can get into lab and practice. I just want to point out to you in your course packet, it's really the, like one of the first things you're going to see. And so the vital signs um, directions for you, I'm pretty sure they're page three of your course packet and page four is actually the vital signs checkoff sheet. Does that make sense to everybody in the course packet? So when you are studying this week, just look over the instructions and that particular, that particular sheet in your packet. So these are what you're going to be doing. You're actually going to be taking your client, you're going to get their height and their weight and we are, we're going to put the scale in a back area with a screen because none of us want to step up on a scale. Um, but it'll just be, that'll be what we'll do and see how tall we are. So height and weight. You will have to um, convert the height and weight into height into centimeters and weight into kilograms. So you'll notice in this PowerPoint it tells you what the formula is to do that and that's one of the things you'll convert. Because as nurses we always do both. You know, so, and then you're also going to do blood pressure, temperature, pulse and respiration. Now some of you that have had nurses aid training um, sometimes I lecture for Mountain States doing that, but um, vital signs, you might have already had some of this, but because you're into school now as a, an RN, you're going to find that Jarvis goes into more pathophysiology and detail about what each of these vital signs are. The one thing I don't have on here is the vital sign also called the fifth vital sign is what? What is the fifth vital sign? 
pain. And so in your, you're going to see some PowerPoints at the very end of this that talk about pain. So with each one of these, it's going to talk about how height, weight, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, you are establishing a baseline for your client. So we'll know from there if it goes up or if it goes down, how are they doing. Um, with medications, for children particularly, we have to know their weight, but we, this is supposed to be up through like 18 through adulthood. So we're not going to cover, if you've got chapters in Jarvis that talk about kids or pregnant women, that'll come later. You don't have to read the material about kids or pregnant women. You're not held accountable in this course for those two things, those two groups. But sometimes we also do medication dosages and calculations for people that are on special drips as nurses. Um, so this is the formula. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. So when you measure your client's height in inches, and let's say that they are, um, you know, five foot seven inches, you'll convert that into completely into inches. What would that be? Five foot seven. 67, 67 inches. And then what you would do is you would multiply it times 2.54. Okay, so that would be your, you would also record inches and centimeters. Um, it just tells you how to do it. We'll demonstrate that. That's what the practice is all about. But, but one of the things you have to remember is it should be without shoes. The client should be without shoes. The other thing is some of these scales, it's not just electronic scales. We're going to actually have you do the scale that has a weight because that's what you're going to see in some of the clinics. So help, you know, again, trying to help your client. Take their arm, help them on the scale, and help them off the scale. Who's vulnerable for falling? Elderly people. And if you're trying to get them up a scale and, on, and down on the scale, they may get, you know, really woozy. So help your client up and off. Um, so you're going to report, like I said, um, you're going to report inches and centimeters. So 63 inches, 5 foot 3. How many centimeters is that? This is your calculation. Some of you got calculators in your head or in your phones. It would be 63 inches times what? 2.54. What is it? Anyone have it? 150? 160 is correct. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you just round it down to 160. Okay. Now, again, the significance of findings of any of these vital signs, you're going to see this particular slide over and over again. It gives us comparison over time. It talks about illness or medications. And we know that a disease called osteoporosis is a disease where people lose bone mass. And so especially women that are petite um, can have compression fractures in their back or have fractures in their hips. So osteoporosis, you actually lose height as you get older. That's a possibility. So we want to know. Now weight, again, baseline, but weight is the most important indicator of nutritional status. That's why with your nutritional assessment, we're going to have you do a weight and a BMI. Um, we're going to have you calculate the BMI. So weight. Now what we do with weight is we note the weight in both pounds and kilograms. Okay, so one kilogram, you all probably know this from math, is 2.2 pounds. You've heard this before. So as a nurse practitioner at the elementary school, I always take every one of my kids, I convert their pounds into kilograms, and then I'll know, based on their kilograms, I, I determine how many milligrams per kilogram is safe to give them for medicines. I use this all the time in peds. And you can also use it. So if someone is overweight or underweight, that would be an important indication, and that's why we use it. So too, too much or too little, nutrients, dehydration, you might see people losing weight or maybe they're gaining weight fast. I talked about ascites, which is third spacing. That can cause um, someone that's got liver failure or kidney failure, um, they're going to start gaining weight. We also know you all have probably heard a sudden uh, unexplained weight loss could be a sign of cancer. So there's a lot of things that have to do with weight that you're going to be kind of picking up on as your nurses. Um, and so here's a couple of things that, that's, that related to that. Um, and then this just talks to you again about procedure. And you all, the most important thing is not only accuracy, but helping your client often on the scale. So 100 pounds, you divide that by 2.2, and that comes up with a kilogram. So for this one, it's the pounds divided by 2.2 equals the kilograms. And you will be asked to do that.
So this would be 45.45. How would you round that? It's still going to be, I, I, I would probably round that to 45.5 kilograms, right? At least, and that's a 45 and a half kilograms. Um, temperature. So height and weight, I think you've got a concept of. There's going to be electronic thermometers, but there's all kinds of electronic thermometers. I mean, dehydration can make a person get hot, or if you're out in the snow, oh, so I mentioned the word snow, you get too cold. Um, we've got all kinds of thermometers, but usually it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, it depends what the agency prefers. Um, what you're going to see are different types of thermometers. So what thermometer do you know of that's kind of outdated now? The mercury thermometer. So you might still see a glass, that's what's in the picture here, a glass thermometer, but because of the mercury and mercury poisoning and that kind of thing, they're kind of doing away. But do you, think, do you think families still have mercury thermometers in their medicine cabinets? They do. I have one too, actually. Um, um, so mercury thermometers. So you kind of need to know as a nurse, and maybe you'll go to a mission trip in Ecuador. You think they're going to have electronic? They didn't when I went. So you've got to look at those mercury thermometers and at least know that they're in two tenths and, you know, and, and, and use them, of course, with caution and care and clean them. But now we have digital ones. We have, which um, usually what you'll see in the hospital, those could be tympanic, which is in the ear. So you have something like the otoscope and you've probably seen those. You have tempodots. It's paper and you actually stick it under the tongue like an oral thermometer. And then you also have... Um, Temporal, which is across, if you've got a child in a school, where I work at the elementary school, the uh, LPN that works there, she takes her thermometer across and down that temporal artery, and it's, just, it's like a skin temperature. It can be very accurate. So most of them are accurate. Um, and uh, These are the routes, oral, rectal, axillary, or axillary um, skin, and tympanic. And each one of those um, can be used. And then what I did with you is I just basically said when, you know, I asked about the when would the oral route be contraindicated. So if a person smokes or eats or drinks, there is a waiting time before you'd want to take an oral temperature because it could affect accuracy. Um, when would the oral route be contraindicated? When would you not want to stick a thermometer under somebody's tongue? Say it again. If they're intubated because they could actually have dry and, and all kinds of yeah, temperature variations. What else? I'm sorry? Oh, yes. A child or someone, not even a child, maybe someone that's confused or comatose. It might not be as easy to get an accurate one because they can't hold it. So you might want to look for an, a tympanic or some other. If they've had oral surgery, perhaps, um, anything that, or are they on oxygen? So look in Jarvis. It gives you all kinds of ideas about that. Um, axillary is safe and accurate for infants and children. The rectal, we don't usually use rectal very often, but you can if you've got the problem up here and a doc wants a real accurate one and the other ones aren't available, you can use a rectal thermometer. You have to get a special kind. I mean, if it's electronic, you're going to see that it's the red button versus the blue, but you have to lubricate. You can't stick it in and leave it. <laughs> you may not find it when you come back. And OSHA principles are there too. Um, all right, so when would a rectal thermometer be contraindicated? When would a rectal thermometer be contraindicated? Say it again. If they have rectal bleeding, excellent. Or hemorrhoids or some other GI problem, diarrhea even, you wouldn't want to use it for that. So again, some, some alternative would be better. Tympanic, of course, is in the ear. It's quick, efficient. This is the one that they says is awesome because it's la not too much cross-contamination. You know, so that's a good one to use. Um, these are the norms, um, and that's supposed to say higher. Um, so I wanted to point out a couple definitions. I put definitions. These definitions should be in your lab book, but if they're not, then they're testable. These are the terms we use for high temperature or low temperature. So hyperthermia and hypo. Febrile, you all may know, that means fever. And afebrile, the prefix a means without. So whenever you see a in front of any word, think about without, without fever. So that's a term we use commonly in, in, in um, nursing. Um, significance, high fever could indicate what? 
infection. And then of course low fever could be someone that's in surgery or maybe um, was exposed to cold or maybe something else going on. Now blood pressure. Blood pressure is, um, you all will learn more about this. The blood pressure is actually the pressure that is um, exerted against the vessels when the heart contracts and then when it's relaxed. So when the heart contracts with every contraction, the, the blood that comes out through the vessels, that is called systole. Um, so that's called the systolic pressure. And so that's the top number that you listen to. It's called the systolic number. And then the diastolic number is the pressure that's in the vessel when the heart is relaxed and it's refilling. So systole is contraction, diastole is relaxation. And so you listen to, as you're, when, you, when you put the blood pressure cuff on, and there's a few rules about that, then you, you pump it up and you listen with your stethoscope over the brachial artery and you slowly release the air. You're listening for the top number to be the systolic reading. And then the last beat that you hear is called the diastolic. All right, so this is just telling you about it. Jill, come on down. Um, and then diastolic is the relaxation time. So these are the factors that you're going to read about. And if you're a CNA, you might have read about some of these. But these are the, in your learning path though right now. Yeah. OK, come here. Are you OK? Yeah. This is what happens hi. when you raise your hand in health assessment. Yeah, right. So sit up here. Oh, hi. OK. Hi, Jill. This is hi. Jill. Jill, this is the class. Hi, hi. <laughs> if you don't feel comfortable, it's no, OK. All right. So. These are, the, these are um, the factors, and I said four, but I actually listed five, so <laughs> it was late last night. All right, so it's, it's cardiac output, and cardiac output is the amount of blood that is um, pumped out with every um, contraction. That's the cardiac output. Cardiac output is really important. The vascular resistance um, throughout the body, it, it affects blood pressure. How much blood you have, so if someone is bleeding to death, their blood pressure is going to drop. That's volume. Thickness of the blood is viscosity. What if someone has some kind of anemia that their blood's gotten thicker or sickle cell anemia or something like that where their blood thickness changes, that affects blood pressure. And then how elastic are the vessel walls? And as we age, they get less and less elastic. So that can certainly, you all have heard about people that as they get older, they might find out that they have hypertension, which is high blood pressure. So 120 over 80, that used to be the standard, but now the American Heart Association says, hey, that's still pretty high, and it's trying to get us down lower and lower and lower. And of course, we've got diet involved and family history involved and all kinds of things. Um, so a couple of things that I want to tell you. These are some things you need to know. Hypertension, postural hypertension, that means that when someone changes their, um, uh, their position, their blood pressure can drop postural hypotension. So if you have a client laying in bed and you sit them up too fast and then try to get them up, you're going to see them probably collapse. But you, that's why you move patients slowly. But their blood pressure can drop. So if you have someone with postural hypotension, you take their blood pressure laying down, sitting up, and standing up if they have a problem with that. Um, and then um, we also have something called the pulse pressure. That's a definition you should know. What is pulse pressure? It's the difference between systolic minus the diastolic. So if you've got a person with blood pressure 160 over 100, that is way too high. But it, what would be the pulse pressure? 60. And so that is the number. And so what we see with some, with some neurological conditions, as you get more and more into nursing, you're going to see that increased intracranial pressure, that number gets wider and wider and wider and bigger. So that's an important thing. So um, what do you do here is we're going to look at a couple things. And since Jill gave us her blood pressure, one of the things, uh, her cuff, <laughs> give me your blood pressure. <laughs> one of the things um, that you should look at is does the cuff fit? Does the cuff fit? And when you look in your book, you're going to say, it's going to tell you that if it doesn't fit, it's going to talk about all the errors you can make in taking blood pressure. Well, one of them is, what if I had a person, what if I had a child's cuff and it was only this big and I tried to put it on an adult, what would happen? What would happen if it was this small? It would give me a false high because it's too small. It would have to pump up so much that it would make her blood pressure really high. Now what happens if I had, for Jill, a cuff that went all the way up to her elbow? 
what do you think that would do? It would give me a false low because there's not enough pressure. The, the cuff has to match. So the rule of thumb is the cuff, this cuff should be about two-thirds of the upper arm. It should cover about two-thirds of the upper arm. So it's two-thirds of the upper arm. I'm trying to see, let you guys see. So and, and you would have her, her, her shirt up, but I think it's going to be hard, so I'm going to let it stay down. So you look and see, okay, every one of them has an artery arrow on it. Find the brachial artery. So I would palpate her brachial artery. You got a great one. You got a good artery. You're alive. Oh. Yay. Okay. Then I'm going to point the arrow above the brachial artery and I'm going to put on the cuff. And this honestly takes some practice if you've never done it. So it's firm. Now, geez, this is hanging down, but most of the time you can find a place to hang these, mm -hmm. okay, or have your patient hold them, but it looks like it hangs right there, okay. Then, so I've got this, what you're going to do then is I've palpated the brachial artery. Now in your book it'll talk about you hang on to that and pump it up and feel when it lets go, but I always ask, what does your blood pressure usually run? That's a great question. She doesn't know. So I'm going to go, okay, well, 120 over 80 is normal. So I'm going to, since she doesn't know and she looks young, you're young, you are young. I'm going to go about 30 higher. I'm going to go up to 150 and see if I can catch it. So stethoscope can be at the bell or the diaphragm, but I usually start with the diaphragm. And don't want to put your thumb over it necessarily because your thumb has a uh, pulse. And I'm going to check. So you pump up, you turn, you turn the bulb. And I always hold it in my right hand so I can manage the, the turner here. Turn it towards her to tighten it. And I'm going to pump. I'm watching the numbers. I'm going to pump it up to at least 150. Then I'm going to slowly release. This all takes practice while I'm listening. And I'm listening for that first number. And I'm going to do it on her skin. And I'm not going to talk. And I'm looking, I already heard the first one, so I'm going to go ahead and release it a little bit more. And it's gone. So, what I got was 126 over 70. Okay, that's because you're in front of a class. Yours probably runs <laughs> normally 106, I bet. But hers was 126 over 70. Now, how did I know that? Okay, so you have to get used to these. Sorry, Jill. Nice one. Can we give Jill a hand? Yay. What a brave soul, except I recruited you without your choice. But um, I just wanted to tell you, you can, you can stay here for a second. Okay. Just, I want to show you. With these, you want to look, with, with an, in, in the hospital when it's digital, it could be even or odd numbers. But if you use a blood pressure cuff like this, always record in even numbers. Every one of these lines is two. Okay. So I watched and I listened, and I can see that it goes from like 80 there's a line in between 80 and 100. I know that's 90. So when you hear the first one, you kind of get in your head, where did that line in the heartbeat, he, where did I hear it? And so it's, if it's three lines above 120, that's 126, and that's where I heard hers. And then I let it come down, and then I heard the last one at 70. It completely went silent at 70. So within six, you have within six to, to check off, and that's going to be really easy for you. But t this might take some manipulation if you've never done it. Take your blood pressure cuff, and everyone you meet on the elevator, in the grocery store, anywhere, ask them if you can take their blood pressure. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, we're almost done. I just want to um, tell you this is the, this is the actual reading. Um, this is documentation. It's also important to say Am I, is the patient sitting or lying? Which arm did you use? Those kinds of things. Um, then the pulse, ladies and gentlemen, you've got pulses everywhere, but the most common pulse we check is the radial pulse. And so I always use two fingers. You can go this way, or you can come behind the person and go this way. Practice taking pulses if you haven't. Some of you are athletes and you've already started taking your carotid pulse. Don't do it at the same time or you'll pass out. But pulses, check it. What we're, what we're really feeling for is the force of the pulse. And I, when you start your reading, if you've already read chapter 9, you know that pulses normally are rated at 2 plus. So 1 plus is a weak and thready pulse. 0 means medical emergency. You're going to lose that, whatever limb it is. Um, 3 plus and 4 plus are more like bounding pulses. 
Um, so checking pulses. And then respirations, I just want to, so there's your scale. I just want to tell you about um, respirations. When you do respirations, you don't tell someone, now I'm going to look at you while you breathe. You try to count the respirations when they don't know you're counting them. So after you've checked the pulse, you can write it down and you can count if it's regular, doot, do 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 <laughs> that is not regular. If it's regular, then count it 30 seconds and multiply it by two. If it's irregular, count for a full minute. Respirations, after you counted the pulse, take the arm of the pulse again. You could lay it across your person, but then they think you're checking your pulse again and what you're really doing is watching their breathing. If it's regular breathing, it's okay to go 30 seconds and multiply it by two. Sometimes for breathing, I count the full minute. Um, just kind of take it here. There's one more section I want to talk to you about, and that's pain. And I have a few slides about pain. There's a whole chapter on pain, and we'll talk some more about pain in lecture. But it is a subjective. It is whatever the patient says it is and when they say it is. And sometimes we get off on these, all oh, these people are just drug seekers and that kind of thing. Well, there's different types of pain. So someone with deep tissue injury may have chronic pain. And so this just lists the different sources. And I'm, I'm giving you these, and I'll tell you what you do, is you go and read now if you haven't already, because I know that, that that sometimes happens. Here are some of the definitions, referred, nociceptive, and neuropathic. And so you should read those in anticipation of a little bit more lecture when, um, um, when we come back. And then it talks about acute and chronic pain. But you guys, I just want to, this is the bold. You guys from now on are the advocates for pain assessment and pain management. So what you have to look for are these things. And in Jarvis, it has assessment tools and some examples of assessment tools. So I want you to look at these pages. There's eight questions that they have you ask for initial pain assessment. And there's different types of tools. Most of you that have worked in the hospital, you've seen nurses say, I'm going to check your pain. And zero is no pain. And 10 is the worst pain you've ever seen. Well, how would you rate your pain? So every time as a CNA or as a nurse, when you go in, you should ask about pain. And so those of you that are not CNAs, this is something that you need to start doing because pain is such an important vital sign. Um, so patient advocacy and pain management. This would be what sample documentation is, and we're going to work with you. We're going to have a vital sign sheet. So you'll put your blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and height and weight, and, a, and you can ask your partner if they're in pain. But that's what it might look like for some sample documentation. Um, I had a couple of critical thinking questions on here. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it because I didn't put this on until late. But what do you think the answer is? Which constitutes appropriate? in measuring a client's weight. Have client leave on their coach shoes as long as this is documented. Weigh the client at the same time of day if sequence weights are needed. Always weigh the client with undergarments on. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. Choose whatever scale is available. <laughs> what do you think? B is the right answer because they say if you can use the same scale every at the same time of day, it's really the best way because you're looking for what? Whether or not they've lost weight or nutritional issues. Try this one. The nurse will avoid doing rectal temperatures on what client? Unconscious, oxygen through the nose, rectal bleeding, or seizure disorder? That's like one of those da moments. Of course, that's right. All right. It's been a pleasure to meet you guys. Um, Email either one of us and let us know what your questions are, okay?